Hey guys, it's JC. We are back talking today about Christ-centered wellness. I want to do a few videos to broaden what we mean by that. We've already talked a little bit in previous ones about how it's not just physical, it's emotional, mental, spiritual, all aspects of our health. But today I have to highlight what I'm calling an unlikely key to Christ-centered wellness. And the reason is, I, well, the reason is I've been thinking about it all week. <laughs> That's the reason. But here's the thing. As we come to Christ, for those of us who are believers in him, we are clean to him, we're drawing closer to him, we need help in all aspects of our health. And so we're coming to him and asking for that. I think a lot of times what we want most, and I'm talking from personal experience, but I know I'm not alone. We, we want that robe of love just wrapped around us. We want his comfort. We want his healing. We want his strength. We want to be filled and empowered and oh, he can do all those things. Absolutely, that is a huge part of his role as our redeemer and healer and savior. So I'm not discounting that. It's one of the reasons I adore him. But there's another aspect to Christ-centered wellness that we need to maybe highlight because it's not generally the top three on our list of what we're coming to him and asking for and praying for. But it's key. It's crucial. I'm going to be in John 15. I use that so much. I know I do. <laughs> I adore that chapter also. John and I are just gonna be buddies in the next life. We're, I just wanna hang out and talk to him. I just think he's so amazing. Um, John 15 is where Christ is giving them, in the beginning, the analogy of the vine and the branches, that he is that vine, we're just a branch, and that he is the vine that gives us that sustaining, um, filling influence so that we can grow fruit. And fruit is what we're talking about with wellness, right? Christ-centered wellness. We want abundant fruit in all aspect, aspects of our health, physically, emotionally, mentally. I'm going to keep you saying that list. We want to be fruitful. And so this is a good analogy to use. So in, in verse one, he says, I'm the true vine and my father's the husbandman. I'm using the King James. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch, here it is, that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit, that it be more, that it will be more abundant, growing fruit to the fullest measure it possibly can. He's got to purge it. He's got to purge it. Now, if you look in other translations, most other translations use the word prune or trim. A few years, a few used cleanse, but we know what pruning is. I mean, we've seen someone prune a fruit tree. Maybe you've done it yourself. We have a lot of trees um, when we moved into our house that were overgrown. And my husband took a chainsaw out there and went nuts. <laughs> I mean, those trees needed it desperately. He cut away all the, the bulk, the dead wood, the extra growth that was keeping that tree from its full potential. You see where I'm going with this, don't you? The interesting thing is in verse three, in the King James, it says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And I never really connected that to the purging. Now you are clean. But then I, I was reading in the message translation of this passage, and he uses the word prune. God prunes or the Lord prunes those so they can be more fruitful. And then he says, now you are pruned back is the way the message says it. You're pruned back through the word which I have spoken unto you. So as we come to him to do what he does best as we offer maybe we're focusing on our physical health right now or it is deeply in the mental realm that we're focusing and we're trying to process some things there emotionally spiritually yes we can come to him for comfort for enlightenment for strength for love but we we need to be open to pruning for me that really, when I began um, reaching for that and asking him for more and more as he'd whack off a branch here, a little, you know, bulk here and dead wood there, it was so empowering and so liberating. I began to ask for more pruning. In fact, I was talking to someone in a coaching session this week and she was talking about how she knows that she's been trying to find the easy way to make improvements, but she goes, I know, I know the path is going to be hard and painful were the words she used because of this very process. 
But then we began talking about shifting those words because yes, yes, pruning is difficult. It can strip you. I mean, sometimes it feels like a good haircut. Like you're really just in the mood to just for a change, let's get rid of it. And it feels amazing as he begins to prune and show you places in your life that need to be changed. But sometimes it, it does hurt. It is incredibly painful um, because those branches are part of us. That isn't just dead wood. It, it's been something growing out of us for a long time and we may not want to let go. It may be painful, but we were talking about the liberating nature of he, he knows what needs to go. Physically for me, sugar addiction, emotional eating, a lot of those things I've talked again and again about in my videos. That needed to be pruned out of my life. I didn't need him to pat me on the head and say, it's okay, you're doing great. He had to come and say, no, this is some repentance in this area. But he has done that for me emotionally, spiritually, uh, mentally, in a big way. In fact, listen to these quotes. I've got a couple for you and I will put the books, the link to the books for these in the description box. This is Andrew Murray from The Practice of God's Presence, his book. Oh, I love Andrew Murray so much. But he uses a different word than pruning. And I think it might be easier to swallow. <laughs> he uses the word unlearning. See, again, we're not just coming to him to have him improve our wellness. Before we can do that, there's some things we need to unlearn, to prune, to trim, to cut away. Listen to how Murray describes it. Or is it gloat? I don't want it to glare on my glasses. <laughs> Drive you crazy. Unlearning is often the most important part of learning. And I have a memory of using this maybe in another video, and I'm sorry if I did, but it's a great quote. You can hear it again. Unlearning is often the most important part of learning. Wrong impressions, prejudices, and beliefs are obstacles in the way of learning. Until these have been removed, the teacher labors in vain. The knowledge he communicates only touches the surface, and I'm going to suggest Christ is our teacher. He can only touch the surface deep under the surface. The pupil is guided by what has become second nature to him. So the first work of the teacher or our savior is to discover and make the student, the pupil see and remove those hinder hindrances, the prune. There can be no true and faithful learning about Christ when we are not ready to unlearn. By heredity, by education, by tradition, we have established our thoughts about religion and God's word and our health, our thoughts about life, our mental processes, our emotional processes, the way we eat, the way we, do you see what I'm saying? Our whole health has been wrapped up. Sometimes we've established these things and they're great hindrances to our learning the truth. There's blocks, there's roadblocks, there's um, dysfunctional patterns. There's old patterns from childhood that need to be stripped away. He finishes to learn of Christ requires a willingness to subject every truth we hold to his inspection for criticism and correction. It's the pruning. Don't squirm. Don't squirm when I keep saying pruning. Like maybe it's time to just take a brief, deep breath and know this is for our good. As he prunes, it makes our branch able to explode with fruit. That is what we're asking for in Christ-centered wellness, isn't it? One more. This comes from Stephanie Tucker in her, her book, The House That Grace Built. This is actually a second book in a series on codependency. So it doesn't have a lot to do with what we're talking about. But oh man, she nails it with this. Actually allowing God inside our hearts to see, expose, and diagnose what is occurring requires the ability to trust him. Like a surgeon being given access to cancer growth, we must allow God to perform the spiritual surgery of our souls. What do you think about that? The spiritual surgery of our souls. That's how we get to wellness, is to allow the great physician to cut out the cancer. Whether it's, it's food issues, food addiction, whether it's codependency, that's one I'm being pruned big time. I mean, oh, there's so many areas that in my marriage, in my parenting, that need to be pruned. And we shy away. All we want from him is a warm blanket. We just want him to comfort us and strengthen us. And again, he's very good at that. But he also is the great physician and he knows where the cancer is. I stopped in the middle of her quote. We must allow God to perform the spiritual surgery of our souls. 
while the end results will be for our spiritual health and lives. In the moment, the thought of facing the painful knife of truth can be difficult. That's why we must trust in the one who will perform the work. In fact, if trust is missing, we may resist and disallow his access all together. It's okay if you're not completely comfortable with this. <laughs> I understand. I felt that way too. Um, let me close with a book recommendation. Let you just chew on it for a while. We'll talk in other videos about this process of unlearning or pruning or the knife of truth, the spiritual surgeries she talks about. I think once we allow him to do it a little more and more and see the results of it, we'll be more open to it. But for now, let me suggest, I've, I've shared this book lately on my social media and I had to include it because it's just exactly what we're talking about. Can you see it? It's called Finding Spiritual White Space by Bonnie Gray. Link below, link will be below. But the, the subtitle is Awakening Your Soul to Rest. Awakening Your Soul to Rest. And so often when we think of rest, we just think slowing down, peaceful, calm. And that's how she starts out the book. She says, I'm ready to write a book on rest, finding rest in Christ. And that's how I pictured it. And suddenly she started having panic attacks. And long story short, she learned and explains exquisitely in this book. It's one of the most beautifully written things I've ever, ever read. The Lord brought her rest through spiritual surgery. He dug all the way down to the surface and started to unearth all of this stuff that had been buried in her psyche from her childhood. She's very raw and very real in this book. And she talks about how the rest came from letting him dig all that out and prune it away. These are the things that are weighing down our branches. Again, whether it's our physical health, our weight, our, you know, all of that, whether it's our minds, our hearts, we're going to find rest and wellness and health by letting him prune, by letting him expose it. Yes, it's not that fun at first, <laughs> but then it kind of is to go, oh, wow, that's why I'm like that. That's what was causing it. It's like a splinter that's buried deep, deep, deep. And yeah, it's not fun to dig and go, but when it comes out, it feels so good. <laughs> so the unlikely key to Christ-centered wellness is as a branch, letting him show us how to be pruned, how to be cut back, um, cleansed, whatever word you want to use. And that's probably, I think, what we'll talk more about in the weeks ahead is how that can be a good thing and how we can ask for it and rejoice in it and um, come to him, not just for the warm, fuzzy stuff that he's good at, but to allow him to do spiritual surgery as needed. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you'll come back for more and we'll continue on this topic. Have a great week.